Carl Gustav Mannerheim lived a life closer to a character in a novel than an actual person. He was a daring cavalry officer, Russian spy, soldier, and field marshal. Mannerheim fought in all the major wars of the 20th century. He was close friends with czars and warlords alike and traversed the world. He managed to save his country from invasion as a daring general and won Finnish independence from Russia. Matter of fact, he was the only true winner of the Russian Civil War. Mannerheim not only was a great general who held off Russian forces much larger than his own in the Winter War, he was also a master diplomat and statesman who was able to negotiate Finland out of the turbulent Second World War in a time when any wrong step would result in the end of Finland and Soviet conquest. Matter of fact, Finland was one of the only countries that fought alongside Germany that didn't sign an unconditional surrender or was conquered. Mannerheim even won the respect of Stalin, one of the most ruthless dictators of the 20th century. Mannerheim was the last of the chivalrous nobles of old Europe, a man who despite the odds being against him managed to land on top. Mannerheim was born in 1867 to a wealthy Finnish family. While most of the country lay in poverty, Finland at the time was just one of the many countries swallowed up by the forever growing Russian Empire. By the time Mannerheim was born, Finland had been under Russian occupation for more than 60 years. While the Tsars granted some rights to Finland by the time Mannerheim was born, like the right to have a diet and the ability to speak Finnish and Swedish, in public, the average person struggled to get by. Mannerheim, despite coming from a rich family, was bankrupt due to his father squandering his family's inherited wealth. In shame, his father fled to Paris with his mistress and left his family behind to pick up the pieces. Mannerheim didn't take his father's abandonment well and started acting out. But instead of starting an OnlyFans or engaging in other fatherless behavior like robbing a Walmart, he volunteered to go to military school. At school, Mannerheim learned Russian, French, English, Finnish, and German. All in all, Mannerheim spoke five languages. Wow, you guys barely speak English. But Mannerheim mostly spoke Swedish, his mother tongue. After years of schooling, Mannerheim was expelled in 1868 for leaving without permission. Mannerheim then took some time off and applied to different schools but failed to get in, until his uncle was able to get Mannerheim into the Nicholas Calvary School in 1887. What made the school special was that it opened doors in the Petersburg garrison, which was the ideal place to be in the Russian military due to its proximity to the Tsar and also because the capital was undergoing massive levels of industrialization with millions moving into the city in search of work. Mannerheim went to school in the center of the city, and this is where he mastered Russian and honed his skills as a writer. Upon graduation, he was sent to Poland, and after a year of garrisoning the Russian border, he was transferred into an elite guard regiment, which opened him up for joining the higher ranks of the Russian army. At a towering 6'4", Mannerheim became the best writer in his regiment, winning dozens of competitions as a cavalry officer. During this time, he got married to a daughter of a Russian general, but the relationship quickly fell apart due to the lack of interest, and by the turn of the century, Mannerheim's wife fled to Paris. Mannerheim wouldn't see again until 1936, decades later. In 1896, though, Mannerheim would take part in the coronation of Nicholas II, the last and arguably worst Russian czar. Mannerheim was a staunch monarchist who deeply admired the czars, despite all their obvious flaws. Throughout the First World War, he'd meet with the royal family to brief them on the status of the war and spoke fondly of them. In later years, after the Civil War and Finnish independence, Mannerheim continued to have close ties with the surviving Romanovs in exile, and even kept a picture of the last czar on his wall. Upon the outbreak of the Russo-Japanese War in 1904, Mannerheim volunteered to fight, despite everyone in his life being against Mannerheim going off to war, especially Mannerheim's brother, who was exiled from Russia for being a member of a Finnish nationalist group. Mannerheim ignored all the naysayers and left for the front in late 1904, arriving in China in late November. Mannerheim was then assigned to the 3rd Manchurian Army as a staff officer of a Dragoon Regiment. Upon his arrival, Mannerheim noticed that the Russian army was in complete disarray, with most of the men too drunk or too incompetent to fight. Mannerheim did his best to restore order amongst his ranks, but to no avail. The war was already lost. But Mannerheim reached the war just in time to take part in the final and largest largest battle of the conflict, the Battle of Mukden, where close to a million troops slugged it out on the frigid Chinese steppe. During the three-week battle, Mannerheim took part in daring scouting missions deep behind enemy lines. While scouting, he took note on the effectiveness of machine guns and how the Japanese hid their artillery with camouflage, making them hard to find, unlike the Russian guns that sat out in the open and were quickly destroyed. During one scouting mission, Mannerheim moved ahead of his battalion and discovered that they were walking into a meticulously set up Japanese ambush. Mannerheim after being discovered by the Japanese, escaped and promptly ordered his battalion to retreat. For saving his men, Mannerheim was promoted to colonel, but the Japanese gained the upper hand in the Battle of Mukden and forced the Russian high command to order withdrawal. This orderly withdrawal quickly turned into a chaotic mess, as Russian soldiers routed in terror. Despite the Russian lines collapsing, Mannerheim stood firm and led his men to safety on horseback till he collapsed from exhaustion. With the front line in ruin, 
The Russians put all their hopes on the Baltic Fleet to win the war. But as you all know, the Baltic Fleet was destroyed in the Battle of Tsushima, the naval disaster that effectively ended the Russo-Japanese War and made Russia the laughingstock of the world. But Mannerheim, instead of going home, like most of the Russian army, he stayed in Asia for another two years as a spy operating in northern China. Mannerheim was chosen personally by the Russian general staff for his writing ability during the Russo-Japanese War. Mannerheim would take part in the final days of the Great Game, the competition between the British Empire and the Russians on who would control Central Asia. Mannerheim Mannerheim's job was to join a small caravan of French scientists to map out Chinese military infrastructure in the advent of Japan and China, forming a military alliance and using northern China as a springboard for an invasion of Russian Siberia. The assignment was two years long and extremely risky, but Mannerheim took up the challenge and left in 1906. Traveling over 8,000 miles, he explored the Chinese borderlands, even crossing the Gobi Desert into central China, while being stalked by Chinese police who were suspicious of the expedition. For Mannerheim, it was a coming-of-age adventure of a lifetime. Fifty pages of his memoirs are dedicated to the expedition. It was a chance for him to escape the shame of a failed marriage and losing the Russo-Japanese War. While in China, Mannerheim even met the Dalai Lama, and the two had a long conversation, with at the end of their meeting, Mannerheim giving his personal revolver to the Dalai Lama. After two years in China, Mannerheim returned home and briefed the Tsar personally on his travels. Instead of meeting for a few minutes as intended, the Tsar and Mannerheim talked for over an hour about China. From two years of scouting, Mannerheim accurately concluded that once China formed into a centralized government, they'll become a great power and thus a rival to Russia, which happened over 70 years later. As a reward for his service in China, Mannerheim was given charge of a cavalry regiment in central Poland on the authority of the Tsar. Mannerheim thus passed over the heads of hundreds of other officers vying for control of a cavalry regiment. As commander, Mannerheim taught his men how to fight in the age of machine guns. Instead of charging directly at the enemy, like in the Napoleonic Wars, he advised flanking attacks and dismounting the fight on foot. In short, Mannerheim turned his cavalry into mobile infantry. For his efforts, Mannerheim was promoted to major general and given command of a lifeguard regiment. At this point in his life, the world was on the cusp of the First World War, but Mannerheim was at peace. By all accounts, Mannerheim was a success. He made a name for himself in the army and was now a general with close connections to the Tsar. Mannerheim was even getting back in touch with his family who were living in Paris at the time, but this was all about the change with the outbreak of the First World War. Mannerheim was in the epicenter of the Eastern Front when the first shots rang out in August. The general was stationed in southern Poland, where he faced against the Austrians. From there, he led daring but futile cavalry charges against the Austrians, with each assault ending in disaster and heavy losses. Mannerheim did his best to hold his men in the front line together, but there was little he could do in the mass chaos. Mannerheim was then transferred to Romania, where he had some success facing off against the Germans in a non-static front. But the front line in all theaters slowly but surely began to collapse as the Russian people rebelled against their officers. In an act of desperation, the general staff promoted Mannerheim to lieutenant general, but there was little he could do at this point in the war. In 1917, the people overthrew the Tsar and the monarchy abdicated in way of democracy. Frustrated after the Tsar's abdication and the birth of the provisional government, Mannerheim resigned from frontline duty and returned home. Upon the outbreak of the communist rise to power, Mannerheim took a train ride to St. Petersburg to try and start a counter-revolution against the Bolsheviks. Upon his arrival, he found the city in chaos as mass violence raged throughout the streets. Mannerheim desperately tried to gather aristocrats of former generals together to try and fight back, but they were too scared and broken from years of constant warfare to resist the communists. Deeply frustrated, Mannerheim returned to Finland, sneaking out of the city before the Bolsheviks found out what he was doing. As Mannerheim returned to Finland, the country declared independence and started to receive support from the Germans, i.e. arms and equipment. Mannerheim was at first against Finland declaring independence from Russia, believing it to be impractical, but joined the movement anyway in order to preserve Finland from the horrors of Bolshevism. The situation in Finland quickly deteriorated with the country falling into civil war, as Finnish Bolsheviks tried to take power. Mannerheim was then tasked by the new non-communist Senate to raise an army. Mannerheim's first orders were to move north to set up his headquarters. From there, Mannerheim began raising militia that he would call the White Guard. These guard regiments would be joint led by Russian officers and Finnish Jaegers who fought with the Germans during World War I. The White Guard in Finland would also be partially led by Swedes, who crossed the border as volunteers. In early 1918, Mannerheim moved to disarm Russian troops that were still garrisoning the country. By removing these Russian troops, Mannerheim was able to get rid of a massive communist manpower pool. Mannerheim disarmed successfully over 80,000 Russian troops without a shot being fired. He accomplished this by making deals with Russian officers. In response, the horrified Reds in the country quickly rose up and took control of Helsinki. After taking control of the South, the Reds moved north to fight the White Guard, while the White Guard moved south to re-establish control of the country. Mannerheim was able to quickly take back Finland in less than three months, despite being outnumbered 
outnumbered and outgunned. Mannerheim retook the country in a few set battles, and this is where Mannerheim's leadership proved to be the decisive factor in the white victory. In 1918, once the Civil War was won, the Germans landed in Finland to force the Reds to surrender. Instead of the invasion being met with armed resistance, as some wanted, Finland welcomed the Germans. Matter of fact, Mannerheim met the Germans in Helsinki once the Finnish Civil War was won. After the landings, Germany appointed Frederick Charles, the Kaiser's brother, King of Finland, till the end of the First World War. When World War I ended and German power basically evaporated in Eastern Europe, Mannerheim was placed in Charles' stead as regent of the country. As regent, Mannerheim planned on launching an offensive into Russia and tried to work with other white Russian armies in an attempt to retake the country from the Bolsheviks. Now, I'm not going to go too deep into the complexities of the Russian Civil War in this video, but the white Russians basically were stupid anti-Semites who'd rather lose the war than receive help from states that seceded from Russia. In 1919, Mannerheim was able to gain his country's recognition for Britain and America. He then, once his regency was over, ran to be the first president of Finland, but lost due to his failure to win over elites. After it was all said and done, Mannerheim withdrew from public life. During the interwar years, Mannerheim remarried and was gifted a fat pension from the government as a thank you for saving the country from communism. Throughout the 1920s, Mannerheim served on varying boards and nonprofit organizations, as well as traveling the world. He went hunting in India, visited Winston Churchill in London, and went hiking all throughout Central Europe. Mannerheim was finally able to enjoy life, no longer worried about making a living. In the 1930s, Mannerheim was an advocate for rearming the country in the wake of German militarism. He also tried to make a defensive pact with Sweden, which promptly fell through. By the late 1930s, war hung in the air once more, and in 1939, Germany invaded Poland, and the world once more was plunged into war. As the war raged throughout Europe, the Soviets turned their focus north to Finland. One of the most critical factors behind the Winter War was the Soviet Union's aggressive expansionist policies. Under the leadership of Joseph Stalin, the Soviets sought to expand the Russian sphere of influence, particularly in Eastern Europe, and create a buffer zone to protect Leningrad, now St. Petersburg, from potential threats. Finland, with its long border with the USSR, was viewed as a threat to Soviet security due to German landings in World War I. As a result, the Soviets wanted some land around Leningrad, modern day St. Petersburg, which the Finns refused to hand over. Stalin, after the invasion of Poland, felt emboldened to use his military and went to war with Finland. The Winter War, which started on a bleak day in November 1939, stands as a testament to the resilience of a small nation against overwhelming odds. As the icy wind swept across the Finnish landscape, the people of Finland found themselves embroiled in a David and Goliath struggle against the Soviet Union. It was a war marked by bitter cold, impenetrable fortresses, and an unwavering spirit of the Finnish soldiers. Despite being outnumbered and outgunned, the Finns demonstrated unparalleled determination, crafting skis for guerrilla warfare and defending their homeland with unmatched valor. War broke out, and the Finnish government once more asked Mannerheim to save their country from invasion. Finnish forces took up position along the Karelian Isthmus against the Red Army. The poorly equipped Russian troops found themselves stuck around Lake Ladoga. The Red Army had been weakened by the infamous military purges in 1937. Any officer with talent was either dead or in prison. All that remained in the Red Army was part of Yesmen, who incompetently raced into the country in the dead of winter against the Finns, who had home field advantage. During the first weeks of the war, the Soviets tried to take the Finns the Mannerheim Line, which was a series of defensive fortifications. The Soviets tried to break through the Mannerheim Line in vain with almost comedic results, with tanks running ahead of the infantry and being forced to wait for the rest of the troops to catch up. Red Army soldiers weren't given proper equipment to fight in the winter, and as a result, whole units literally froze to death. While the war was raging, the Finnish government tried to get support from the West, but they were basically ignored with members of the US government being Soviet sympathizers. In short, the Finns were alone. Eventually, Stalin managed to get his shit together, and with better generals and supplies, pressed their attack against the Finns, who started to buckle against the overwhelming superiority of the Red Army. With little Western support and a forever growing of Russians on the Finnish border, the Finnish government decided to make peace and surrender territory to the Soviets. Despite signing a ceasefire, the Finnish army kept on mobilizing, and Mannerheim was still in charge of the army. With enemies surrounded on all sides, the Finnish government knew that they wouldn't be able to ride out the Second World War despite making peace with the Russians. In Finland's eyes, the Winter War was over in everything but name. The Germans quickly took advantage of Finland's isolation with Hitler making a deal with the Finns that if they help take part in Operation Barbarossa, they'll be able to retake their lost territory and then some. Hitler also promised to protect the Finnish coastline from Russian invasion. Finland agreed to these terms as long as they were able to stay out of the war as a whole, so they didn't want to fight Britain and America, but they would agree to fight the Soviet Union. Instead of officially joining the Axis powers, they joined a brothers-in-arms agreement. On June 22nd, 1941, Germany invaded the Soviet Union, as you all know already. Finland promptly joined the war in hopes of toppling the Bolshevik regime 
regime and to finally secure Finnish independence once and for all. Mannerheim had around 500,000 men at his disposal at the start of the invasion, which was a major portion of the male population. These troops were now armed with German equipment thanks to the Brothers in Arms Agreement. The Finns then poured into Russia with the Germans, with the goal of retaking the Karelian Isthmus, which was lost during the Winter War. But by the end of the summer, Mannerheim was able to restore Finland to its 1939 borders, but became bogged down by the Red Army, with the Finns losing around 25,000 men in the first summer alone. Mannerheim then became stuck in a three-year stalemate with the Russians. Finland prepared for a brief summer war with the Soviets, but now found themselves isolated as the Germans failed to take the city of Leningrad. The Germans, once they realized that they couldn't take the city, outright tried to get the Finns to play a more active role in the siege. But Mannerheim lacked heavy artillery, tanks, and bombers to conduct an actual siege of a city that large. As the situation grew bleaker, Hitler came to visit Mannerheim on his 75th birthday. Finnish intelligence bugged the meeting, which recorded the only conversation of Hitler where he wasn't ranting and raving. This recording was used by Bruno Ganz for his role as Hitler in the classic 2004 movie Downfall. In the description below, I'll have a link to the recording. By 1944, things were not looking good for Germany, with major defeats suffered at El Amain and Stalingrad and Leningrad. The writing was on the wall that Germany would lose the war. Finland was now alone, isolated, and surrounded by enemies. Mannerheim and the general staff decided that it was time to pull out of the war. But withdrawing from a world war would be a diplomatic feat in the tightrope walk. Any wrong step would result in the end of Finland and Soviet conquest. Despite the stakes being so high, the peace talks that Finland started with the Soviet Union were stalled by political infighting. No one in the Finnish government, not even Mannerheim himself, wanted to be the ones who signed peace with the Soviets. While the talks stalled, Stalin launched a massive offensive against the Finns in an attempt to force them to the table. Thanks to the help of German fighter support, Mannerheim was able to at least keep the front line from collapsing in on itself. Once Mannerheim saved Finland from Soviet invasion for a third time, he was once more made regent in parliament and then finally president. But Mannerheim was 77 years old and declining in health. He didn't want the job but felt duty bound to navigate the nation out of war before he died. After a month in office, Mannerheim finally made peace with Stalin, with both leaders communicating personally. Stalin grew to respect the white Russian general, the last of the old Russian nobility, who managed to survive and even thrive with enemies surrounded on all sides. Mannerheim signed the harsh peace terms but managed to avoid being forced to accept unconditional surrender like the rest of the Axis powers. Mannerheim was forced to cede swaths of Finnish land to the Soviets at the cost of Finnish sovereignty, but Finland was able to remain an independent country. The Soviet peace talks also stated that Mannerheim was forced to drive the Germans out of Finland through military means. Finnish troops by the end of 1944 turned against their German brothers in arms. Mannerheim then fought a brief war against the Germans in what was called the Lapland War, where Finnish and German troops crashed on the Norwegian border as German troops conducted a fighting retreat out of the country and into German-occupied Norway. Once the war was over for Finland and peace was signed between the two countries, Mannerheim fled to Portugal. Parliament, once peace was secured, put the old government on trial for collaborating with the Germans. Mannerheim remained in power till the trial was over before resigning. Once he was in the clear from being charged for war crimes, Mannerheim retired from public life. With the war over and peace secured for Finland, Mannerheim turned to writing his memoirs and finished it before his death in 1951. To conclude, Mannerheim lived a life more akin to a character in a novel than an actual person. He was a brave cavalry officer, spy, general, and field marshal. Mannerheim fought in all the major wars of the 20th century. He was friends with czars and warlords alike and traveled the world. He managed to save his country from invasion and won independence from Russia. In fact, he was the only true winner of the Russian Civil War. Mannerheim not only was a great general who held off Russian forces much larger than his own, who was also a master diplomat and statesman who was able to negotiate peace when odds weren't in his favor. Mannerheim was the last of the chivalrous nobles of Europe.